Hey guys, Sleepy Reader here. Um, in my car again. Uh, I hope I'm in the shot. I've, uh, I've been having a lot of trouble with this camera. Um, battery dies, and then I lose the whole video that I've shot. Uh, and I've just been missing my opportunities to make a review video of last week's comics, but I thought I'd give it a shot now. I'm in the parking lot of the library that's on the way home from my job. Picked up these these books from the library today. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Uh, comics I picked up last week, last Wednesday, included uh, Guarding the Globe. Um, issue 2, uh, based on the Robert Kirkman Invincible World by um, Phil Hester and... Todd Nock, with great coloring, I should say, by John Rausch. Um, this issue, the art and the coloring seemed even better to me in this issue than issue one. Maybe I'm getting used to it, or maybe they've actually been improving. It's incredible how well they handle this, this large group of superheroes. Um, and I enjoyed the book again, although I kind of forgot some of what I'd learned in issue one, and I... I need to dig up issue one uh, again and reread it, I guess. Um, so the basic thing is we're just following this this group of heroes, the Guardians of the Globe, I guess they're called, um, as they go from one assignment to another, <coughs> uh, managed by some secret agency in the United States. Um, but they seem to be international. And, and it's all good superhero stuff. Um, with a villain who's cloning himself and genetically projecting his own DNA into men around the world so all their babies will be clones of him. That was pretty wild. Um, and we just, we get tons of characters all really well drawn. Um, this is definitely the sort of grown-up, just in the sense of mature characterization and everything, version of a, a team of superheroes. It reminds me just a touch of Alan Moore's Top Ten and and of kind of uh, old TV cop or lawyer shows where you have a, a cross-section of the department and you follow a lot of different characters. If there's any flaw here, it's that um, uh, there's not like one character or, or a few characters that we really can emotionally attach to so far. We're, we're kind of scattered shot. And like I said, I had a little trouble remembering... Um, characters from the past issue already. And some characters I'm pretty sure were not in this issue. Or, like for instance, the talking dog. I really missed that. But so this, this is, this series is still a keeper for me. Um, yeah. So that was very good. Dial H feels like it's improving a bit, although part of it is the art is even better. And in my little um, coloring video where I did where I just looked at coloring, the, the coloring and the art in this book are excellent. Um, the writer still feels like he doesn't have the hang of comic books. And when I read that a new artist is coming on here, I wish instead a new writer was coming on. Um, there is something, though, in the sensibility of the weirdness and the goofy superheroes and all of that stuff that I really like, even though I feel like the writer's not pulling it together. Um, you know, like, there's there's stuff that happens near the end of the comic that is not at all clear what happened, but then after it ha a page or two after it happened, the characters say, oh, this is what happened. Um, and how could they have known any better than me? I, I couldn't figure that out. The the uh, writer is is kind of weak in making clear everything that's going on. But, um, you know, the uh, this Abyss supervillain has now, if he is a supervillain, but anyway, he's a threat to our reality, was, was really cool here. Um, and the main hero that our guy turns into, that's a combination of a chicken and a hoop, is really cool. What was he called? Cock-a-hoop? <laughs> Pretty hilarious. Um, so, I hope this keeps getting better. One reason I think why DC is probably sticking with this, um, this writer is it maybe he'll do really well in the bookstores. 
He's a very well-known science fiction fantasy writer who's won a ton of awards. I think he's won the Arthur C. Clarke Award three times or something crazy like that. I'm pretty sure he's won the Nebula Award and the Hugo Award. So he's a real big shot in the book publishing world, and so maybe they think his name on a cover will do a lot of business in trades. I hope they're right. Um, or I hope they just get a different writer on this. But, you know, someone like Jeff Lemire or Matt Kent would be wonderful here. Stormwatch is a um, comic that's constantly on the line for me of whether I'm going to drop it. I didn't get the Zero issue. But this issue was surprisingly good. Um, I still am a less of a fan of the new artist, um, Will Conrad, than I was of Miguel Sepulveda. But uh, he does a very good job. He's just closer to a more standard superhero kind of shtick. Um, but but he, the art was, was nice, and, um, and there was this clever idea. They bring in the demon Etrigan, um, and he really is an evil force here, and I guess he was buried under a building, and that makes everybody in the building do evil things. And, and it, it was handled really well. And the characters of, um, what are they called? Apollo and Knight. Oh, suddenly I forgot his name. I want to say Nighthawk, but it's not Nighthawk. Uh, anyway, uh, those it's a solo kind of adventure of those two characters, and it's done very well. It continues in the next issue, and I'm really looking forward to it. So, for the moment, Stormwatch is back on my thumbs-up list. Uh... I'll be excited for the next issue. Danger Club 4 was really good. Um, I don't like looking at that cover, though. And I had to go back and read issue 3 to just sort of remind myself who the characters were. And issue 3 was really good. Rereading it reminded me of that. But even in issue 3, there's parts I don't understand. I feel like I have to go back to the very beginning and read things really closely. Um, Danger Club is written as if you've been reading it for 10 years already. Um, and that's kind of cool, but it also it makes it uh, harder work. Um, the other thing, it was suggested by David Lee that maybe this is going to end in six issues. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's right. It, it feels like we're already coming towards an ending in issue four. It could be wrapped up in two more issues. I hope, I hope that there's an arc beyond that. It feels like they've destroyed so much of their basic world. It's hard to see where they're going, other otherwise, other until sort of a, a shattering ending. But if you've been reading Danger Club, definitely pick up issue number four. If you can get all the issues, get it. It's one that you definitely have to have all the issues, I think. Um, it'll probably make a great trade. Hopefully one of those cheap trades from uh, Image. And then another pair of books, the two Rot World books, the Rot World Twins, Swamp Thing, and Animal Man, as has been pointed out by uh, better reviewers than me, like uh, Minutia Minute, I think he did that, uh, that these two issues are kind of twins, with twin plots that are very similar, um, where Animal Man or Swamp Thing comes back to the world, a year later, and Rot World has happened. It's taken over the entire world. There's just a tiny en enclave of the red, and a tiny enclave of the green, and the rest of the world, as far as I understand, is rotting corpses. Um, pretty mind-blowing. Um, uh, almost too big of a plot, in my mind, because they call this Rot World now. Um, and how are they going to... They have to return the world to DC so that all our other comic books can continue. Um, and how are they going to do that without some kind of, oh, it was all just an alternative future rather than it being now. And part of me wishes they just found a way to have Animal Man and Swamp Thing and maybe a few other characters battle the rot in the regular world, just not noticed by everyone else, but this epic battle sort of interst interstitial within the rest of what's going on. But they, they didn't do that. They chose this more apocalyptic approach, and it's it's fun. I think I liked Animal Man better. I read it first, and so that might be part of it, because since their plots are so similar, 
where each one comes back, finds out what's happened, and travels to um, the enclave of the red or the green, depending on what they are, and and then the issue ends. Um, but I also liked I liked the guest stars somehow worked better for me and Animal Man with with this rotted hawk man, and then um, who was it? Uh, Beast Boy and and Black Orchid. Oh, and another thing I liked more about Animal Man is it had flashbacks um, to Animal Man's family, and I think that that fam the family part is more of a grabber than um, than the uh, flashbacks to Abigail Arcane for me. Maybe I because I haven't read enough Swamp Thing. Maybe I'm not as involved in. Abigail as I am in Buddy Baker's family. And it was done so well with a really nice sort of second artist with and colored really nicely. So I think they're both they're both good. I am still worried about sort of being over rotted. I'm a little worried about Frankenstein, Agent of Shade entering Rot World 2, although I'm also curious what they'll do with Frankenstein there. Um, so, but these are, these are still really good books, um, and I'm glad I got them. And finally, the best, the best book of all, uh, for me, this week, was Earth 2. Um, great art, great coloring, great writing. I think it really is a team between the artist and the writer. Together, they make these great moments. These are all, you know, a lot of this is familiar superhero team moments. Um, the big fight and the clash between different members, or they haven't become a team yet. Um, and the new guy beginning to learn, you know, beginning to gain some powers and or gain some confidence in what he's doing and acting. And the characters were all done really well. So anyway, so what I feel about this is it's a classic superhero book with just lots of little bits that make it a little different than what you've seen before. And the issue of um, Alan Scott's lover, who seemed to be killed off so quick, comes back and is now going to be um, quite a useful plot element. Um, uh, so where that lover at first just seemed like a bland, uninteresting thing, now there's a twist in it and uh, and it's very interesting and I think it says it's going to conclude in the next issue so if so it'll make a nice done in one trade um, so yeah and there even is a shout out or a call back to the zero issue so that made me glad I'd read the zero issue even though the zero issue was weaker than the rest of these um, and that zero issue really showed us how important Nicola Scott is to what makes this book so good, and how she really brings forward James Robinson's ideas and, and makes the big moments really big and, and the characterization really work and all of that. So yeah, I think that makes it a very good week in comics. Uh, I did pick up some Marvels, but I guess I haven't read them yet, and they may not have been as recent. So perhaps I will I'll do an odds and ends review that'll cover a lot of Marvels I've been reading later. I hope you guys are all doing great. Um, love hearing everyone's comic book review videos. I want to make a shout out to one of the really new guys. Um, now I'm going to... Dreadful Reviews, I think his name is. And he used to go under the name Judge Dreadful. A uh, young guy over in England has been doing some good reviews, just getting going. Give him your support. I'll put a link down below. Hope this video worked. Talk to y'all later.